So, um, moving on to our third speaker now, uh, Jörg Gross from One Spin Solutions. Um, he's a product manager for safety critical solutions. Jörg is um, at One Spin. He has more than 20 years' experience in EDA, functional verification, and ASIC design, uh, having served at companies in Europe, the USA, and in New Zealand. And the title of Jörg's talk is Fault Formal Fault Analysis for ISO 26262. Uh, fault metrics on real world designs. Over to you, Jörg. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mike. Um, as Mike was already saying, my talk is about um, formal fault analysis, which should help us to solve the ISO 26262 challenging we are facing, especially in terms of uh, verification. And I will also give you some uh, numbers on, on real world designs in this talk. Um, as an introduction, um, what is uh, functional safety? Um, the, the things we design, especially for ISO 26262, uh, um, are the cars, and um, we, should, um, we should not impose risks of uh, injury or damage to, help, uh, to the health of people here. Um, and um, so if we identified um, uh, that then what are the um, uh, safety risks and the safety risks really come from either systematic failures or random failures and systematic failures are basically the ones we introduce in the design cycle or into a design those systematic failures are actually the nature of them are actually that they are present in all devices and then we have the random failures uh, we already talked about that uh, in, or we already mentioned that in the previous talks are the ones which uh, occur in the single devices, like hard or soft errors, and an example for that is, for example, a ledge up uh, inside an IC. Um, then if we have risk, we have risk drivers. Uh, you're all well familiar with the ever-increasing complexity in design flows and functionality, and we also have uh, the risk of moving down uh, the design nodes and uh, decreasing energy levels, which, for example, can uh, impose after soft errors more easily. Um, if you have those risks, then how do we manage them? And here the functional safety standards come into play. So, and the target really of the, of the functional safety standard is to either minimize the systematic errors or safeguard against the end of, uh, random errors. And I will talk about safeguarding against random errors exclusively in the, in the next slides. So how do we safeguard against random errors? There is, uh, we have our mission uh, design function and what we have to do here is um, wrap around a safety mechanism. And this example here shows a, uh, shows a hardware safety mechanism, but this could also be uh, software which is periodically running to check that the design is still correct. So if a fault occurs, what has to happen? Um, we need to activate the fault. If you never activate a fault, then the fault could never manifest itself. Then also it needs to be propagated. And then if the safety, mechanisms, uh, safety mechanism is able to observe uh, faulty behavior on the mission outputs, it can uh, raise an alarm or alternatively correct uh, the result. Um, we have uh, the fault types we have are hard or soft errors, and um, so we typically manage, uh, model them with either stuck at faults or uh, the single event fault model. This is a very high level view on, on the um, safety flow in terms of random errors. So what we do, we start off with, the safe, with our safety requirements or safety goals. Um, we go down one path where we derive a safety specification from that. Then we implement that specification. Um, so we have the design plus our uh, safety mechanisms. And then the verification starts where we have to, uh, for example, verify that the safety mechanism uh, works correctly. On the other side, we have our FMEDA. Um, which does analyze all the safety mechanisms uh, and eventually 
assuming certain uh, diagnostic coverage of those safety mechanisms and from there eventually calculate uh, the reliability of the device uh, or in other words we uh, calculate the fit rate of the device. In order to run a decent uh, fault campaign to actually verify that our diagnostic coverage assumptions are correct, we have to somehow associate the design areas we defined with the safety mechanism and calculate the area and the fault list, which as said, we put then into our diagnostic coverage verification. And the next slides are actually about the diagnostic coverage verification in detail. So one metric uh, we have to satisfy is the uh, single point fault metric and this is taken out straight off the standard and the single point fault metric is actually calculated uh, by having as Bren uh, was saying the, the good stuff divided by all the stuff <laughs> and um, to hit a, whole, um, a high ASIL level for example ASIL D you have to reach 99% uh, single point fault coverage. If we look at how we, um, how we calculate that metric, we have different fault classes. Uh, we have the safe faults. Uh, safe faults are the ones which are not a relevant part of the logic or they are in relevant parts but cannot impact the safety goals. Then we have the two dangerous classes which are single point or residual faults and the only difference um, is that one is in this, uh, for one we have this safety mechanism and for the other we don't. And then there's this multi-point fault uh, that's a little bit confusing but from a hardware point of view uh, it's actually the detected faults, so the faults which uh, could alert the safety mechanism. So now zooming a bit deeper on the safe faults because if I flip back it is really important to um, get the safe fault population right. So if you imagine you're not identifying 5% of the safe faults, you can never hit uh, your metric. And going into the safe faults, there are several reasons um, why we have safe faults in the design and I'm only considering the stuck at faults here. So Safe faults can occur due to uh, static IC operations. For example, if we, uh, in, in the normal mode of the device, debug is always disabled. And it should be shown here with this little multiplexer. So basically, uh, there's only one path selected. Therefore, the non-selected path uh, contains safe, possible safe faults. Uh, the next one are, um, I call them explicit redundancy in hardware which do mask the effect of a fault. An example of that is, uh, for example, performance. So if the fault only impacts the performance of the chip and, and, but not the correctness of the results, they can also be classified as safe. Then we have the uh, truly redundant faults, basically introduced by synthesis uh, deficiencies. And then obviously we have the uh, uh, faults inside safety unrelated logic should be shown here. And um, what I would like to mention here is it is not as easy as just uh, looking at an output port and then do a cone of influence analysis and, and uh, wipe out all the faults which are in the cone of influence of, uh, of this output where we don't care for. Uh, because they are always interleaved with, uh, typically interleaved with uh, safety relevant logic. All those uh, four classes have one in common, they actually can't propagate to an observation point. Basically they can't impact the mission function. Uh, and typical observation points are actually the mission outputs or also internal registers. So if you assume you have a software safety mechanism, you're going to read some registers in doing compares so uh, those registers can also be used as observation points. So what we developed at one spin is uh, what we call a um, fault propagation analysis app. Um, and this um, tool allows you to classify the faults into non-propagatable faults, which are actually the safe faults and propagatable faults. Uh, we can perform this analysis on gate or RTL level designs, what the user has to give us is uh, the list of observation points and some environment constraints like uh, 
debug of, for example. And um, we are we do support uh, the stuck at fault model, so stuck at zero, stuck at one. So let's assume we are using uh, this application. Then what can we do with it? We could uh, formally identify safe faults, and this diagram here should show. Um, when um, to, how to calculate your single point fault metric um, with help from fault simulation. So this is this is assuming, for example, a software safety mechanism, and you run your uh, fault simulation campaign. Uh, if you don't apply formal methods here, you are basically on the uh, blue curve. And what typically happens in the field, what we see often is you run your fault simulation and you end up with, uh, for example, 75%, but not with your desired 90%. Formal uh, analysis can help you in the way that we do a, uh, what we call a fast safe fault analysis upfront. This finds typically more uh, safe faults than, for example, the fault simulator gives you. So you, you're starting off better. Then we suggest to still run your fault simulation. Uh, if you're hitting your goal, everything fine. If not, we can also help you further with what we call a deep uh, propagation analysis. And that gives you insight on how, for example, the fault propagates through the design uh, or where it gets stuck. So you can also identify safe faults this way. This slide uh, should show uh, some, some numbers for the um, fast fault propagation analysis. What I would like to note here is that that fast analysis is always ex executed for the uh, full fault population. So all the faults are considered during this analysis phase. And it shall, as I said, it shall be executed before the fault simulation or before the deep uh, fault propagation. Um, and, uh, numbers for an RTL example, um, we have a decent size uh, processor core here, uh, roughly 800 uh, registers, 12,000 faults. The, fault, uh, the fast fault analysis takes about uh, two seconds, uh, sorry, two minutes, and it can identify roughly 26% uh, safe faults. At the gate level design, we have run this uh, on designs with up to 2 million faults. Um, then the fast analysis takes uh, several hours. Uh, we always try to keep that in an, in an overnight run. This is our goal. Uh, and we've seen numbers up to 14% uh, on gate level designs. Inc this obviously includes the untestables as well, which you would, give, uh, which you would get from a fault signal. Then deep fault uh, analysis, what we see here is that on the very same design to, for example, prove uh, a safe fault, uh, it takes about 20 to 30 seconds. Um, we typically give it a time budget um, because the variance can be pretty large uh, or the proof time for a given fault can be very large. So we have a cutoff point to find the safe or identify the safe faults more quickly. Um, for this example, we, we did identify another 13% uh, percent of safe faults. Um, what I would like to note here is that this design is not uh, optimized by synthesis, so therefore we have a pretty high number. Uh, typically, on gate level designs with the deep analysis, we find something around 1% to 2%. And that's obviously after we ran fault simulation and uh, the fast analysis. So very quickly, we discussed the uh, diagnostic coverage. I would like to um, jump to the verification of the safety mechanism because formal tools lend themselves very well to address that problem too. So when we have a hardware safety mechanism, uh, if there's no fault in injected, this hardware mechanism is pretty much inactive. So the ISO standard recommends to use fault injection for verification. 
uh, depending on the complexity of your input combinations and the complexity of the of the faults you would like to inject, like for example two bit errors, um, this could be a very large input space which is very hard to attack with simulation based approaches. So what we are suggesting is to use uh, formal verification with fault injection and if you already have a formal verification environment this is very easily set up because all what you have to define is that when a fault is injected you would like to see the alarm being asserted. This is in the trivial case just one more assertion you have to write. Um, to give you a real life example as well here, um, I would recommend to um, dig out this presentation here from Holger Busch uh, at Infineon. I believe he also wrote a paper for DAC, so if you go and search for this or send me an email, I can, I can give you the pointers to his, um, to his work we've done. So he has used um, our formal uh, technology together with fault injection and was able to prove the um, the safety unit in one of their uh, one of in Infineon's uh, microcontrollers. And with this, uh, I would like to wrap up. So we exclusively focused on uh, safeguarding against random errors. I explained mostly the pro, uh, the, the challenges with uh, diagnostic coverage and how formal technology can help here. And I quickly introduced you to the verification of the safety mechanisms. Obviously, formal tools can also help you to minimize the systematic errors through rigorous verification and also um, the quantification of that verification task. I would uh, like to say thank you and um, I'm open to questions. Thank you very much, Jörg. Um, we do have time for questions. We're running a bit late because uh, we had so many questions for John and Cadence, so we'll give a bit of time for Jörg's questions. Uh, there's one question online, uh, Jörg from Bezarts. Uh, because gate level typically contains a magnitude of nodes more than RTL, how do you know you verify that 99% coverage at RTL level is also 99% at gate level? How does, uh, this, how does yeah. this relate to uh, state space explosion? Please. Yeah. I would actually not recommend that from from a safety uh, perspective. I believe the standard will pretty much demand that you are doing your final analysis always on the gate level, even post layout gate level. Um, the RTL is, is more towards an exploration phase. So if you can't hit your numbers on the RTL level, it's probably not much point to go to the gate level. That's the way I would see it. In terms of state explosion, um, the formal model is actually whether you have a, a gate level design or an RTL design doesn't change much the, the underlying formal model. So we don't, don't see a lot of performance uh, uh, decrease when we go from RTL to gate. Okay, uh, are there any questions from Bristol? Okay, York, there's no questions from Bristol and there's no questions from Cambridge or, or Grenoble. So I think we're, we're, we're thank you for that point. Thank you, York. Thank you. Thank you.